ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد Today then, in Kitab al-Tawheed, we have arrived at the chapter Bab Ma Ja'a Fi Dhabhi Li Ghayri Allah The chapter regarding what has been mentioned in terms of slaughtering for other than the sake of Allah. We know that the act of slaughtering, it is an act of worship. But it should be noted as an introduction to the topic of slaughtering a dhabh that there are different types of sacrifice, different types of slaughtering. One of those types is a general slaughtering that is done upon habit and upon the norms of the people. For example, some guests come to you and so you slaughter in order to provide a meal for them. That is from the norms and the habits of the people. It is an ordinary form of slaughtering something, slaughtering in order to uh, honor those guests who may have come, for example, or slaughtering to invite some of your friends or whomsoever it may be for some food that is an ordinary form of slaughtering a custom uh, or, or a habit amongst the people that they would do this a customary slaughtering to feed the neighbors or the, the guests or whoever it may be the second type of slaughtering which is the slaughtering of ibadah specifically. Even though the first type, of course, you would still slaughter in the proper and accurate manner in accordance to the sharia. But in this category now, for the purposes of classification, the second category is the slaughtering that is done specifically as an act of worship not necessarily because you have guests at your house or anything else but it is done a slaughter is done purely for the sake of an act of worship this type falls into three categories this type of slaughtering falls into three categories one of those three categories is the Islamic and legislated form of slaughtering. That a person slaughters for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely. For example, on the day of Eid, Eid al-Adha, that would be an example of a slaughtering that is done upon the Sharia, legislated as an act of worship. The second type within this category of slaughterings that are done and considered as an act of worship is the bid'i slaughtering, where a person slaughters as a form of worship but in a way that makes it a bid'ah. For example, he takes his animal specifically to the grave of a prophet and slaughters it there. For the sake of Allah, not for the sake of the prophet or anything else. So it is not shirk, but it's a bid'ah at the least what he is doing. Slaughtering in a specific place that is not legislated to be done in that way. 
slaughtering specifically and wanting to do it specifically next to the grave of a prophet next to the grave of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam maybe even so that would be considered a bid'i form of slaughtering it is not legislated for you to go to those specific places and to carry out your slaughtering especially at those places so that would be considered a bid'a in the way that he has sacrificed the third type that comes under this classification of the slaughtering that is considered an act of worship or being done for that purpose the third type is the shirki slaughtering and that is when a person slaughters for the sake of others besides allah slaughters for the sake of others besides allah and we're going to cover that in detail in this chapter what does it mean to slaughter for other than the sake of allah it is a lot more than just thinking it is for an idol there is a lot more discussion regarding what is considered a slaughtering for other than the sake of allah so what we have mentioned there so far when you think about slaughtering or sacrificing there are two main categories one is the habitual or the customary slaughtering that a person may do he has guests so he slaughters up unto eat for the sake of allah in the name of allah to feed his guests that is from the norms and the customs of sacrificing the other type is where the sacrifice is being done purely under that form of worship not for a guest or to feed someone or to have a meal but specifically as an act of worship then that splits into three categories the first of them the pure legislated shar'i slaughtering that is done upon sincerity to allah sincerely for the sake of allah the second one here is the bid'i sacrifice where a person slaughters for the sake of allah but in a method or manner that is not legislated for he, example he specifies the grave of a particular prophet believing that it's better for him to go and do the slaughtering or the sacrifice at that grave so that is a bid'a if he's doing it for the sake of allah but specifying these locations and places and the third category under this type is the shirki sacrificing and that is where a person slaughters for other than the sake of allah so here this chapter is going to discuss that affair because we know that sacrificing and slaughtering it is done in the name of allah purely and sincerely for the sake of allah as an act of worship it cannot be done for others besides allah cannot be done for the jinn or for whomsoever so this chapter is going to discuss that particular affair and you remember we said at the beginning of kitab at tawhid that as you go through the chapters the sheikh picks out specific topics one by one and highlights their reference to tawhid and how people fall into shirk regarding them so in this chapter he has picked out this worship of slaughtering and sacrificing for the sake of allah and he is going to explain that the people have fallen into shirk in regards to this act that they go and they slaughter for the sake of the dead and for the sake of the jinn and for the sake of others besides allah so the first evidence that he mentions in this chapter the statement of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala qul inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alamin say that my prayer and my sacrificing 
and my living and my dying are all for Allah, the Lord of everything in creation. So here Allah tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to say that indeed my prayer and my sacrificing and my living and my dying all of them are for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Lord of all of that which exists the first point in the ayah is inna salati that indeed my prayer my prayer is for Allah and we know that the prayer is the greatest bodily act of worship. It is the greatest bodily act of worship that a person stands in prayer before his Lord. And that prayer, it has been established five times a day as an obligation. And within the act of worship of praying, there are elements of worship from the heart and from the tongue and from the limbs. All of those elements exist within the act of worship of praying. The heart, worship from the heart, the khushur, the focus and that connection to your Lord. And that's why some of the scholars have even said, as salat comes from the Arabic word indicating sila, sila, meaning a connection, that the prayer is a connection between the servant and his Lord. And that's why in a narration, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, أَقْرَبُ مَا يَكُونُ الْعَبْدُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ وَهُوَ سَاجِدُ That the closest a servant is to his Lord, is when he is prostrating. Think about that for a moment. When you are in prostration, you are right down on the ground as low as you can be. And yet, you are closer to Allah down in that low position. You are closer to Allah compared to someone standing high and tall. You are closer. Even though you are down on the floor, low down in your elevation compared to somebody standing up high and tall, you are closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that prostration. And this indicates the greatness of this worship and the connection of the servant to his Lord during that prayer. And so here Allah tells us, say, Inna salati, that indeed my prayer, it is purely and sincerely for the sake of Allah. And on the day of judgment, we know that the first thing a servant will be tested on is his prayer. Inna awwala ma yus'alu anhu al-abdu yawm al-qiyamah, as-salah. The first thing that a servant will be tested on on the day of judgment will be your prayer. Your prayer, if that is good and upright, then it is expected goodness for you in the remainder of your actions. But if your prayer is not established and upright, then what do you expect of the remainder of your affairs? So the first test upon your actions on that day will be about your prayer. So here, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي نُسُك In Arabic, in the context, can indicate all forms of worship. Nusuk does not specifically mean sacrificing. It means worship as a whole. That is the general meaning of nusuk. But here, it is the specific meaning of sacrificing. That indeed my prayer and my sacrificing, then they are for Allah. This ayah highlights to you that sacrificing is indeed 
an act of worship because it has been joined together alongside the prayer. Say that my prayer and my sacrificing, they are for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, indicating that sacrificing is certainly an act of worship alongside the prayer and that they are both to be done sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the ayah establishes clearly that sacrificing is an act of worship to be done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are many forms of this sacrificing that are done seeking closeness to Allah like the sacrificing that is coming upon us soon on Eid al-Adha, where the Muslims around the world, where they are able to sacrifice for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, during the actual Hajj, then there are these sacrifices done by the certain types of Hajj. If a person was to do them, the Tamattu and the Quran, and there are other forms of sacrificing like the aqiqah. All of these are done sincerely and purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that ikhlas as an act of worship, desiring closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this ayah highlights to us very clearly that say, my prayer and my sacrificing, then they are purely for the sake of Allah alone, along with wa mahyaya wa mamati. And my life, my living, my life and my living, then that is for Allah, because we are here for the purpose of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa ma khalaqtu al-jinna wal-insa illa li'abudun that I did not create the jinn or the humans except for them to worship me Allah told us so here wa mahyaya and my living is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah told us in the Quran الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا Allah is the one who created death and life to test you which of you will be the best in your actions meaning which of you will do that worship of Allah with sincerity and upon the sunnah so the ayah highlights to us Say that indeed my prayer and my sacrificing and my living and my dying, then they are for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not for others besides Allah, not for the dead, not for the graves, not for the jinn, but sincerely and purely for Allah seeking closeness to Allah alone. Then the second evidence mentioned in this chapter, and pray to your Lord and sacrifice for him. Another ayah where the same thing is done again. The sacrificing is mentioned alongside the prayer. Both of them mentioned side by side indicating that the sacrificing once again is clearly an act of worship that requires to be done sincerely and purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this ayah, فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ وَنْحَقْ It begins, of course, إِنَّا أَعْطَيْنَاكَ الْكَوْثَ that indeed we gave you al a river in paradise. So pray to your Lord and sacrifice for him. Some of the scholars have said 
it is a means of showing gratitude to Allah that Allah bestowed upon the messenger al kawthar the river in paradise, and in the more general sense of the meaning of al kawthar all types of al khair all types of goodness were bestowed upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so it is a means of showing gratitude to Allah that you then pray to him sincerely and sacrifice for him sincerely. And some of the scholars have said that the tafsir of this part of the Quran is regarding Eid al-Adha. فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ Pray to your Lord, meaning the Salat al-Eid of Eid al-Adha. وَنْحَرْ And then go and slaughter. Pray Eid al-Adha and then go and slaughter. Pray sincerely to Allah and go and slaughter. Sacrifice sincerely for Allah. So this again is very clear in its evidence, very clear in the point that it is making, that indeed pray to your Lord sincerely upon ikhlas and sacrifice for your Lord sincerely upon ikhlas. And then we have some hadith which also clarify this point further and give more detail regarding this point. So we have the hadith of Ali. رضي الله عنه قال حدثني رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بأربع كلمات. Ali رضي الله عنه says that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم mentioned four things to me. He mentioned four points to me. The first of them, لعن الله من ذبح لغير الله. Allah curses the one who sacrifices for other than the sake of Allah. لعن الله من ذبح لغير الله. The curse of Allah upon the one who sacrifices for other than his sake. And what is the la'na, the curse of Allah, that you are distanced and removed from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so you can see very, very clearly in this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam telling us, the curse of Allah is upon the one who sacrifices for other than the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَعَنَ اللَّهُ مَنْ ذَبَحَ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ But then the question is, what forms of sacrificing come under this banner of having sacrificed for other than the sake of Allah? What forms and types and intentions can come under this banner of having sacrificed for other than the sake of Allah. In the generic sense of it, it is when you are sacrificing, seeking closeness via that sacrifice, seeking closeness via that sacrifice to other than Allah. You are seeking closeness to others besides Allah via that sacrifice. And this can take many different forms. So as Shaykh Al-Fawzan, one of the great scholars of our time, Hafizahullah Ta'ala mentioned that sacrificing for other than the sake of Allah, it includes the one who sacrifices to the shrines, seeking closeness to those deceased ones, in their shrines, sacrificing to the graves and the shrines, seeking closeness to those deceased in those graves and shrines, and the one who sacrifices to the trees and the stones, just like we mentioned in the last couple of lessons regarding sacrificing to the trees and to the stones, and the one who sacrifices to the jinn, 
that all of these forms of sacrifice, they would be considered sacrificing for other than the sake of Allah. And likewise, of course, the one who sacrifices actually and specifically in the name of other than Allah. The one who sacrifices in the name of other than Allah or has an intention for that sacrifice to be in the name of other than Allah to other than Allah seeking closeness to others besides Allah or if a person sacrifices something as a means of hoping for harm to be taken away from himself some people they sacrifice to the jinn hoping that by offering this sacrifice the jinn will no longer harm them that would be a sacrifice for other than the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or some people sacrifice and offer that sacrifice in the name of the jinn hoping that the jinn will not harm them because they have a fear of the jinn so out of the fear of the jinn they sacrifice to them and for them so that would be sacrificing for other than the sake of allah and of course as the mushrikun used to do sacrificing to the idols hoping that the idols will bring them good and remove harm or sacrificing uh, when the rain was not coming down and so in jahiliya they would offer sacrifices hoping that the sky would open up the rain for them all of these types of sacrifices and these types of intentions then they would be considered sacrificing for other than the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they are seeking closeness to other than allah seeking to protect from the harm of the jinn seeking to gain closeness to the jinn so they don't harm them to the deceased in their graves to gain something from them to the uh, idols believing they'll bring them good all of those forms are considered sacrificing for other than the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the narration tells us man the curse of allah upon the one who sacrifices for other than Allah. And then in the hadith, it also mentions the curse of Allah upon the one who curses his parents. The curse of Allah upon the one who curses his parents. And this is something very common that you find in the evidences of the Quran and the Sunnah, meaning that the rights of the parents are always mentioned often along with or straight after the rights of Allah. Here, firstly, the right of Allah has been mentioned. The curse of Allah upon the one who sacrifices for other than the sake of Allah. That is the right of Allah, you sacrifice to him alone. Then straight after that, the right of the parents is mentioned. Curse upon the one who curses his parents. And this indicates to you the high status the rights of the parents have. The high status that the rights of parents have in Islam that the rights of the parents are often mentioned straight after the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like in the Quran, وَعَبُدُ اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do not associate partners with him and do righteousness to your parents straight after mentioning the right of Allah and the requirement of Tawheed 
and the prohibition of shirk, then it is the rights of the parents that are mentioned in that ayah. So this highlights the great rights that parents have. And that is why in the books of the major sins, the different ones that the scholars wrote, the the disobedience and the lack of righteousness to the parents is always mentioned as one of the biggest major sins. And then also in the narration, it mentions other points. That the curse of Allah be upon the one who gives refuge. Man awa muhdithan. The one who gives refuge to the one who has committed a crime that is deserving of the hajj. A person commits a crime where Islamically there is a prescribed punishment upon that crime. You try and protect that person, hide that person, give him some uh, alibi, try to protect that person from receiving the hajj, from receiving the Islamic punishment that is prescribed by the Sharia of Allah upon him for that sin, for that crime, then you are considered in that narration of the curse of Allah upon the one who tries to give refuge to that type of criminal who is deserving Islamically of a punishment prescribed by the Sharia. Another meaning of with a fatha, then that is bid'ah. The one who tries to maintain bid'ah and to keep the bid'ah and to establish the bid'ah, then that person also the curse upon him. So those meanings, both of them are mentioned in regards to la'an Allahu man awa muhditha or muhdatha. And then at the end also la'an Allahu man ghayyara manar al ard the curse of Allah is also upon the one who changes the boundaries of the land. This can have different meanings. Some of the scholars have said it means changing the physical boundaries of where your wall is to your neighbor's wall, changing the boundaries and the fence and stealing land. Other scholars have said the meaning of it is changing the boundaries of the haram zone. We know that around Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi and Al-Masjid Al-Haram in Mecca, there is a haram zone prescribed in the Sharia, prescribed in Sahih Al-Bukhari. Where that haram zone is, it mentions in Bukhari the mountains to one side and the zone on the other side. So we know exactly where the haram area is from north to south to east to west. It is prescribed in the Sunnah where that haram zone is, where that boundary is. So the one who tries to change those boundaries of the haram zone, the haram area around the mosque, then that person, the curse upon him. And the third uh, meaning some scholars have said is the one who changes the signposts of the earth. The signs that you see, you see a sign telling you that a particular city is that way, 50 kilometers, a particular uh, area is that way to the north, 100 miles. Somebody who comes and changes those signs and mixes those signs, then likewise the curse upon him. Uh, but the strongest of those statements is the first, changes the boundaries of the lands, meaning your boundaries of what is yours and what is not and stealing the land of others by changing the posts of the ground. But the main point of that narration was the first part, The curse of Allah upon the one who sacrifices for other than the sake of Allah. Then the final narration that we have here 
is the hadith of Tariq ibn Shihab. أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال دخل الجنة رجل في ذباب ودخل النار رجل في ذباب قالوا وكيف ذلك يا رسول الله قال مر رجلان على قوم لهم صنم لا يجوزه أحد حتى يقرب له شيئا فقالوا لأحدهما قرب قال ليس عندي شيء أقربه قالوا به قرب ولو ذبابا فقرب ذبابا فخلوا سبيله فدخل النار وقالوا للآخر قرب قال أو فقال ما كنت لأقرب لأحد شيئا دون الله عز وجل فضربوا عنقه فدخل الجنة this particular hadith known as the hadith of the fly as you know in the sunnah there are certain famous hadith that go by names like the hadith of Jibreel that hadith is known as the hadith of Jibreel and everybody knows which hadith that is and just like that there are other hadith in the sunnah that are famous narrations and they become known by a title. This hadith has become known by the title of the hadith of the fly. And that is because this narration speaks about somebody sacrificing a fly for other than the sake of Allah and ending up in hellfire. We should mention that this narration has a lot of speech around it regarding the authenticity of it. Some of the scholars have declared it is not from the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but rather this story was narrated by one of the companions. But nevertheless, the point being made in it is absolutely valid. Sometimes you can have a hadith where there is a discussion over the authenticity of it, and so it cannot be ascribed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but the actual meaning of the hadith is completely in line with the sharia. And so the scholars have said the meaning of what is being said in this narration, it is absolutely valid and the point is completely clear. And you'll see that from the narration. It mentions that a man entered paradise because of a fly. And a man entered hellfire because of a fly. When the companions then said, how can that be? How is it that a man entered paradise because of a fly? And another entered hellfire because of a fly? So then it was said to them that two men, they were on a journey and they came across this village or this particular group of people in a particular area and their journey, their route, the roadway passed right through that village or that area where these people were. And it was the only route to go through. The issue was that those people had an idol and they would not let any travelers who came upon them to pass through unless they sacrificed something for their idol. So when these two men happened to arrive at that area and they wanted to go through to carry on with their journey, those people said to them, sacrifice something for our idol. They said to one of the two men, sacrifice something, sacrifice something, seek closeness to the idol with a sacrifice. The first man said, I do not have anything to sacrifice. But they said to him, you can sacrifice anything, even a fly. Sacrifice, even if it be just a fly, for the sake of that idol seeking closeness to our idol, and you can pass. And so he did. He sacrificed a fly 
for the sake of that idol and they let him pass and so he enters the hellfire. The second man they then said to him, sacrifice, seek closeness to the idol. He said to them though, I would never sacrifice anything for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they struck his neck and they killed him. And he enters paradise. This is the hadith known as the hadith of the fly. Where the two men were on that journey and they came across these people. And these people would not let them carry on and pass through until they sacrifice something for their idol. One of the men ends up doing it with just a fly. They say, do anything, even a fly, if you have nothing else. So he sacrifices a fly and he ends up in hellfire. The other one refuses and tells them he would not sacrifice anything for other than Allah. And so they strike his neck and kill him. But the narration says he enters paradise. That narration very clearly makes the point that sacrificing is an act of worship seeking closeness to Allah purely and sincerely, not seeking closeness to an idol or other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even with a fly, not even sacrificing a fly for other than the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that narration highlights very clearly that sacrificing is from the acts of worship that must be done sincerely and purely for the sake of Allah upon the name of Allah and that it is not done seeking closeness to others or from the fear of others or from the idols of the deceased and whatever it may be that the people desire from their forwarding of the sacrifices and offerings of the sacrifices that they may do. So that is the chapter that highlights this act of worship regarding sacrificing and that it is to be done for Allah alone. Next week, insha'Allah ta'ala then, we'll resume with the next chapter. Uh, and up until then, we'll conclude for today. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.